And hey, hi everybody, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. Thanks for tuning in this afternoon or this evening. Um, we're delighted to have Nina Simon with us. She's going to be talking about her, her book, Mother Daughter Murder Night. Um, and I understand that was probably your mom off, sc off screen there, right? Okay. <laughs> Um, and this book you can is invite her to join us if you want. I mean, I tried, can... I really tried. <laughs> <laughs> and the book is getting so much attention and so much buzz. Congratulations, Nina. Thank you. Thank um, you. I'm, I'm honored to be with you all today and just so excited about this journey and the story. Yeah. And so we're actually doing two, two events for Nina. Um, we're doing this virtual event kind of pre-pub as it were. The book doesn't come out until September 5th. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and, and also uh, I'm going to go ahead and put a buy link in the comments field and you can go ahead and pre-order your autographed copy. Nina will be here on September 7th to sign copies. And um, I think we'll have to figure out, Barbara, we're going to do another, another virtual component to that event. We might as well, because these conversations take slightly different tone, uh, you know, with the live audience. So anyway, if you have questions for Nina, Go ahead and put them in the comments field on YouTube or Facebook, and uh, I'll be delighted to ask any questions you might have. So, Barbara, over to you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Hi, Nina. What a pleasure it is to meet you. Thank you for joining us. I'll give you just a little background. Why are we doing this weird thing? And it goes back to 2018 when a book called Where the Crawdads Sing published, and I had a little tussle with the publisher about whether the author should come and sign her book for us. Um, and I didn't, I ordered a lot, but I didn't order nearly as many as I probably could have, and I have regretted that. Um, so when I read Nina's book, I felt I was to some degree revisiting elements mm -hmm. of crawdads that I like a lot. For example, they are Elkhorn Slough. It's not slough, it's slough. Is that just Right. Um, anyway, um, and so I thought we should really order a lot of these, but here was our problem. I wanted it to be an August 1st Mystery Club book because we have a club that does that. And the publisher was okay with letting us have copies early and shipping some to Nina Design for us. But then other things happened and the publication date had to be a firm September 5th, meaning we could go ahead and only sell this book to our club members in August, but we can't let anybody else have it till September. Plus, we ordered so many more that it wouldn't be fair for Nina to have an avalanche of cartons of books to send upon her defenseless self at home. So our policy is if we're up more than 200 books, we figure out some way to get the author to the bookstore because it's just it's just a nightmare otherwise to do it. And that's why we're having two books. Is that enough for you, Nina? Does that now make it clear? Absolutely. Well, and, I, you know, on Instagram, I'm Nina K. Simon, and I shared a video of me trying to haul the 80 books you did send for the book club up the hill um, in flip-flops. I live in the woods, um, and so it was quite an, uh, an uh, effort just to uh, be able to get those books for your club, which I'm so glad I was able to do. And I'm so excited to be with you in person next week. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad that you had an early illustration of, you know, what it's like. But anyway, um, as you can gather, I'm really excited about this book. And I was excited about the book before um, Indie Next Pick and other good, good things that are happening to Nina. Um, occurred. So I'd like to, you know, one of the things we think we do really well at the Poison Pan is to spot new talent and to acquaint you with debut novels. I think we're really good at it. We're going to be 34 years old. I wish I were, but the store will be on October 3rd. So we have a pretty good record, all things considered. So I hope that's a good luck charm for you, Nina. Oh, I, I this whole experience of uh, writing this book and the publishing journey has has felt very much like a good luck charm. So um, I'm honored to be here. Wonderful. Why don't you tell us, if you'd like to, what your journey was? And, and you can edit it down if it's too long a version. So Mother Daughter Murder Night is an intergenerational mystery. It's both a family drama and a traditional murder mystery about three generations of women. There's a grandma, there's a single mom, and a teenage girl who work together to solve this murder in this marine preserve, Elkhorn Slough, where they live. Um, and I never expected 
to write this novel, let alone any novel. Um, but then almost three years ago now, my mom, who like the main character, is a tough, feisty, LA Jewish businesswoman and um, a very young, hip grandma, um, got sick. She um, got diagnosed with stage four cancer and it changed my life. Um, I made some big changes to be able to go to Los Angeles and be with her and support her through treatment. And we were very lucky to be together during that time, but it was also a time of a lot of stress and frankly, also a lot of conversations that were only about one thing. And talking about cancer all the time is not very fun. Talking about uh, protein shakes is certainly not fun. And my mom and I have both always loved murder mysteries. And so one day when we were together having another argument about a protein shake, probably, um, you know, we just realized we needed something else to talk about. And I turned to her and I said, you know, what if I tried writing a murder mystery with someone like you as the lead detective? And, you know, at the time, I didn't think, oh, I'm writing this so that it would become this book. You know, I thought we are going to have a project and something that can be an escape for us, something that can be joyful for us, and something um, that I can put some of my energy into while I'm doing this caregiving and support for my mom. And so we started on this journey where um, in the mornings while she slept, I would sit next to her on her bed and type on the laptop. And then when she woke up, I would pass her the scene I'd written and go make breakfast. And we'd talk about it. And we really developed these characters together. Um, my mom helped a lot with the research. Um, and this project was about us having a connection and us having this escape. And then, of course, what happened is as I kept writing, as my mom kept giving me notes, um, we both realized maybe this was bigger than just our little fantasy and our little escape. And I started to feel that this might be the next path I was going to take professionally and um, certainly creatively. Um, I was all in and it was for my mom and I, this gift, this new center to our conversations where yes, of course, we were still talking about her treatment and her healing. And fortunately, my mom's on a very good trajectory right now. Um, but this book became a world we could escape to that we chose and that um, I could create based on the conversations we were having. That's an amazing story. I'm so thankful that your mom is doing, is on a, a good trajectory. Um, yeah. Cancer is no longer necessarily a death sentence, although, you know, That's we right. all panic at the very thought of the word. Um, I have several reactions, um, but let me start with an easy one, yeah. which is describe to us where Elkhorn Slough is located. Yeah, so Elkhorn Slough is in Monterey Bay, and when you think about Monterey Bay, it's a sea. Santa Cruz, where I live, is at the top. Monterey and Carmel is at the bottom. Big Sur is down here, and then you're headed south to Los Angeles about four hours from there. So um, Elkhorn Slough is right in the middle, um, and it is actually the second biggest estuary in California after the San Francisco Bay. So that means that you're driving along the highway around along Highway 1, you know, which is the iconic highway that uh, runs along the coast of California. And you get to the spot where there is a marina, there's an old power plant with big um, towers, you're, you know, you're on a freeway, there's railroad, but then you look, you look to the right and you see the ocean, you look to the left and you see this river snaking up into these agricultural hills, you see otters, you see egrets, you see pelicans. It's an incredible um, home of wildlife and nature. And it's smashed up against a very um, active human environment as well. And I always find that, you know, um, places that are on the edge of two worlds, whether it be nature and, you know, human commerce, whether it be urban, rural, um, are often places where there's interesting friction. And interesting friction can mean conflict, and conflict can sometimes mean crime. So I've always loved Elkhorn Slough, both as a place I love to go to for peace and relaxation, but it's a spooky place. Um, there is, you know, the fog sits very thick there. And then you also have all these old abandoned farm shacks and these, you know, um, snaking little creeks that go to mysterious places and shark hunting blinds and all kinds of kind of um, rich, uh, juicy spots for a murder to happen. Well, coastal California has 
changed a lot. My Stanford yes. roommate lived in Monterey. So mm. we used to go up and down uh, when you drove yes. to Saratoga and then you yep. split off and went down Highway 1 and hoped that you didn't have a landslide, which happened to yep. me at least once. Uh, so you oh, wow. back yep. up and go all the way back up to El Camino and, you know, go south. Um, and of course, you know, it was more agricultural then yes. than it is now. Um, Monterey Bay is amazing. You know, you can play golf <laughs> or you can go to the incredible aquarium. Um, and, you know, Monterey and Carmel are, are, they're almost anomalies. I mean, they're so special themselves. And then, yeah. you know, to, to go past, as you say, the slew, I've always thought that the industrial towers were, you know, remarkable. Um, well, they are. And actually, I, I'd love to do a mystery there because it's such an interesting thing that you have these these two power plant towers right on the ocean and they are decommissioned now. But one of the reasons they're still there, I talked to a lot of um, wildlife ecologists as I was working on this book, is that there are nesting raptors who love to nest at the top of those towers. And so now they've become kind of a natural resource to the wildlife and the environment. And it's one of the reasons the towers haven't been taken down, which is so wild. And you're right, you know, Elkhorn Slough is on the north side of Monterey County. So it's not the wealthy Carmel golf course part, although that part plays a little bit of a role in this story, but it really is the agricultural, you know, Salinas is called the salad bowl of America. And if you buy organic strawberries or bagged lettuce, it probably comes um, from just a few miles from where this book is set. And actually, you know, this winter, the area where Elkhorn Slough is was in the national news because it was a site of tremendous and terrible flooding in the Pajaro Valley, um, where thousands of people, mostly, um, you know, uh, Latino migrant um, farm workers lost their homes to flooding. Right. But I mean, if you've got Santa Cruz here and you've got, you know, it's an area where, as you say, there are lots of people with lots of money. Um, mm -hmm. It's so close to it that inevitably, I mean, we see here in Scottsdale, you know, this constant creeping growth out into the desert. We mm -hmm. don't have enough water for all the developers every day. There's word of like some new developer and so forth. So Elkhorn Slough you know, needs a lot of protection mm -hmm. if it's going to remain anything like it is. So, you know, plot points. Um, but anyway, it's, it's a gorgeous space. The, the California yes. coast, I think. You know, California was never actually designed by nature and by geography, especially Southern California, for the mm. number of people that live there. I sure. mean, if you build up on a mountain in Arizona, you're on hard rock, you're on granite. If you do it in Los Angeles, you're, you know, you're on sandstone and crumbly stuff. And no wonder it all slides, you know. Sure. Away. I know my father talked to me because he traveled out there in the 30s um, before the war, which really changed Southern California tremendously, about how beautiful it was, how agricultural mm. it was, and so forth. So remnants like Elkhorn Slough, I think, are, you know, really, really valuable. Very special. Yeah. And as you're saying, you know, California and really the heart of the mystery in this book has to do with land, right? It has to do with a ranch adjacent to Elkhorn Slough and many different stakeholders arguing about what should this land be used for. And I think that these are very real conversations in coastal California about agriculture, about housing, um, about venture capitalists coming in because the land is so valuable. And so I think that one of the things I want to explore in this book through the mystery a little bit is this question about um, how do we think about the different paths historically of land in California and in the future and where we want to take our land. Absolutely. And how, how can we preserve it? You know, how much can, mm -hmm. can it become state or federal land? What does it take to make it a monument? You know, we just have one declared here in Arizona by President Biden up mm -hmm. around Grand Canyon, for example. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's an ongoing conversation as resources are dwindling and the number of people are going up. So you're right. It, it's crime, you know, crime fiction depends on conflict. And I've always loved the Sarah Peretsky line. I think it was Sarah, or maybe I just use it to talk about Sarah, that crime fiction cuts along the edge of social change mm. and along, you know, social conflict. And, and they think the best, the best novels, best crime stories anyway, 
do have that that underpinning, you know, of real issues. It isn't just, you know, a kind of convenient plot or something, but there are serious issues and conversations. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we've talked about lamb, we've talked about cancer, mm -hmm. um, and we've talked about family. But if your mom is listening, no offense here, mom, but I have to say that one of the reasons I like this book the best was the completely outrageous nature of, of the grandmother. I yeah. think mother, my mother was tough on her, you know, <laughs> she could clear her room, but um, I don't know that I've run across anybody who quite like Lana before, and, yeah. you know, and Lana, Lana, well, you, you want to describe it, but the, the interplay between Lana and Beth and Jack is really remarkable. Um, but Lana, I think, is really the driving force among the three characters. Beth tends to react to her. Jack is so young. What is she, like 15? That's right. Yeah, so she's, you know, she's not even a fully formed adult yet. She's sure. trying to kind of figure out things. So yeah. Lana, yeah. Lana's really the, the engine here. So absolutely. Is your yeah. mom okay with that? Oh, absolutely. And actually, I would say more than any other notes, and maybe she's sharing in the chat, I don't know, but um, more than um, anything else, my mom and I spent a lot of time talking about Lana Rubicon and about um, how to portray her, how to walk the line of some of her rougher edges in a way that um, still gave her a path to love and connection with her daughter and her granddaughter, but was also real to this very tough, very judgmental, um, very fierce woman. And I think I had a blast writing her and felt like I could write her with love because I feel like I grew up around a lot of, you know, fiery, strong Jewish women um, who, many of whom were single moms and who were fighting hard to be able to make a life for themselves in male dominated industries, you know, making careers for themselves, but also to create opportunities for their daughters. And certainly my mom did that for me and my sister as well. And, you know, it's funny because Lana, no question, she's the star of this book. And actually in the first draft, um, the focus was uh, much more focused on Lana specifically. And it was really working with my editor, William Morrow, Liz Stein, who really pushed me to expand um, Beth, her daughter, and Jack, her granddaughter, to be, if not Lana's equals in the story, to be uh, real partners in the sleuthing that happens. And I think that um, there's a very practical reason for this, which is when you have an amateur sleuth, of course, they can't you know, check out everything. They can't go everywhere. So it's nice to have some buddies in, in crime solving. Um, but also I think that um, Lana is so outrageous and that's so fun. And But it doesn't necessarily make her the easiest character to identify with. And I think that one of the things I've had a lot of fun with with early readers, and I'd love to hear this from folks, once you read the book, you know, um, which Rubicon woman do you identify with? Because I really hear different things from different people. And sometimes it's generational. People will say, oh, I'm Beth, I'm sandwiched between, you know, my aging parent and the child I'm trying to raise. But sometimes people will talk more personality based, you know, um, certainly, I think that uh, my mom and I joke about the fact that I like to say that all the good parts of Lana are based on her and all the bad parts are based on me, you know, that I think that I um, have experienced as a woman who before I started writing novels was a nonprofit CEO, was really pushing all the time, um, that kind of impatience, um, that kind of selfishness. And also I think, you know, Lana is somebody who's incredibly independent. And I think her path in the book in a lot of ways is figuring out that it's not always a source of weakness to rely on somebody else. And I think that, you know, in some ways that mirrored when my own mom got sick, um, she and I and my sister all love each other and we're all really independent women. And for us, it was a big change to express our love, not in a you're strong and good and doing your thing in your city and I'm strong and good and doing my thing in my city, but really transitioning to this kind of interconnected caregiving for each other. And um, I feel like Beth is the character I learned the most from as I was writing this book, because I started out feeling like I don't know how to be a good caregiver. And Beth is a nurse. She's loving. She's, um, you know, very honorable and strong um, and self-sacrificing. And when I started writing this book, I admired people like that. 
but I didn't understand them in any way because I identified much more with the hard charging my way or the highway Lana. And um, I think that for me, there was a lot of learning about how to embrace the Beth inside of me as I was writing this book. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm clearly a Lana, so <laughs> we, we can talk about that, but, um, but what, I mean, you know, let's let's start with Lana okay so mm -hmm. here she's been she's clawed her way up to be a hugely successful real estate broker in Los Angeles she's made tons of money she has great connections great social connections she's a real power figure and then not only does she lose her health but she also loses her money and her business so she everything about her that made her who she was is suddenly imploded um, yeah, and I would say even more important to her, she loses her independence and she loses her power. And I think that I wrote Lana really thinking about a lot of women I know, maybe my age and older, who talk about feeling invisible or feeling that they are becoming invisible as they get older. And I think that Lana has worked her entire life to be seen, to have power and agency and to not be discarded or made invisible. And I think that when she gets sick, I think there's even a line in there somewhere about, um, you know, um, becoming irrelevant was even more terrifying than the prospect of, of dying. And um, I think that for Lana, yes, she's lost her job. Yes, she's lost her home in Los Angeles, but even more, she's lost her freedom and her ability to, to be this powerful woman who is highly seen in the world. And I think that that is what drives her the most bananas as she lies there in bed in her daughter's ramshackle cottage up in Melkorn Slough. Well, I think you're right. And I think that for most people, the trajectory is as you get older, you know, you become more vulnerable, your health begins mm -hmm. to, you know, possibly fade. And it's, it's easier to accept it if it's gradual rather than it happens in the rather abrupt way mm -hmm. it happens. Alana, I, on the other hand, to be personal, was sort of like Beth in my 40s, and then mm. I turned into Lana in my 50s. And now that I'm 82, almost 83, I'm probably even worse than Lana. So um, my trajectory has been the inverse. Mm. Oh, that's Lana. so interesting. You'll be, you know, I also married into a very famous Jewish family. I'm a, huh. I'm a Rosenwald by marriage. Huh. So um, I've learned much about um, what you're talking about through, again, as I've aged. Uh, mm. But children have had to cope with this transition. And I think it's been slightly confusing for them uh, to watch mom get more more like Lana instead of less like Lana. Uh -huh, time, yeah. Well, I think you outside. should. I mean, why yep. the heck not, you know? And well, the frankly, reversal. yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know this, but you look amazing. I never would have guessed. And it's funny, actually, you know, Lana in the book is 57. Um, my mom is 74. And when I first started writing this book, um, she was 72 and I wrote the character at 72. And then, uh, you know, in discussion, my mom really felt like, oh, you know, for people to care about this character, she's got to be younger. And so we made her 62. And then when I had an agent, my agent said, ah, you know, we need her to be a little younger. And so I'm like looking up all these famous actresses online. And um, Sandra Bullock, at the time I was writing, it was 57. And I was like, that's it. This character cannot be younger than Sandra Bullock. Like, you know, there is, I mean, there are so many women who have so much power, much beyond even the age of Lana. I think, you know, it's something that um, I'm actually really excited that I feel like there are more and more books with older protagonists. Um, yeah, it's such a that, thing. You know, no, yeah, it's becoming yeah. a thing in crime fiction. There's a wonderful book called Mrs. Plansky's Revenge. I cannot, mm. I'll, I'll give you one when you come to see oh, us. thank because. you. This is Klinsky, an elderly Jewish woman in Florida whose children are to some degree fleecing her, is fleeced by a Romanian and heads to Romania when nobody else will help her in order to recover her money. Um, oh, wow. oh, that it's, sounds it's fun. A fabulous story. It really, it really is. So I have children older than Lana, <laughs> which also is kind of a weird thing for me. But anyway, mm -hmm. Beth, Beth is where she is in part because she made some choices um not always happy ones um mm -hmm. when she was younger mm -hmm. and so in part her life has been to learn to accept the consequences of of choices she made and mm -hmm. of being a single parent 
mm-hmm. and so forth. So um, that's, you know, a very different story, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting that, you know, both Lana and Beth became single moms to some extent and, and at not too dissimilar ages, but under very different circumstances. And they reacted to that situation very differently. And I think that, um, you know, Beth is somebody who escaped Los Angeles to get out of her mother's uh, control and shadow, but also to have a life that Lana might see as quite small, but involves a lot of beauty, a lot of connection to nature and a very deep connection to her daughter, Jack, as well. And so I think that, um, you know, a lot of the book is not about one of them, Lana or Beth, convincing the other one that they're right, but about two women who are strong in very different ways, learning to respect and negotiate and love each other for the different kind of strength and the different kind of choices that they've made, which I feel like is never easy in relationships and maybe particularly in mother-daughter relationships. Um, And um, I, I think that Beth um, is somebody who actually, I uh, of all the characters, she's the one you know. I said I learned most from, but also um, did the most redrafting through to really make sure that her life felt full and didn't feel like, oh, poor Beth, you know, um, you know, she she has these consequences she has to live with. Um, but instead, to think, wow, you know, this woman has has made a life that she's really defining on her own two feet, even if it's very different than what many people might choose. It's a life she's happy with, you know, mm-hmm. I and mean, she is, you, everybody measures success differently, That's you right. know, and the yardstick for Beth is quite different than the yardstick for Lana. So then at the bottom of this, you know, is Jack, yeah. who, you know, is living with her mother, Beth, and they have a life that they both value, and then suddenly crashing in upon them is Lana, who not only, you know, is so different, but also is very needy even if she doesn't want to be yeah because you know here she is with cancer and you know treatment is required or maybe you know will she just give up or is she going to actually and then on top of all this jack finds a body Mm -hmm. that's right yeah jack is this combination oh sorry go ahead no i was just gonna say for jack you know she's already had this load to sort of dropped upon her you know and then suddenly she finds a body, and by finding a body, as everybody knows who reads crime fiction, the person who finds the body becomes a suspect, right? It's yeah. just, you know, that's the way it works. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that Jack, you know, at 15 is very adventurous, and at the beginning of the story, is starting to itch a little bit against the smallness of the world that um, she and and Beth share. Um, But then it becomes, her world becomes much bigger in ways that she would not have chosen or guessed, you know, namely her grandmother taking over her room and she's moving to the couch um, and then finding this dead body and getting embroiled in this uh, murder investigation. And so, uh, you know, it's funny, I have a daughter, um, Rocket, who's 10 now. She was um, seven when I started working on this book. And I like to think that Jack is the kind of um, teenager that I hope Rocket will grow up to become like. I mean, my daughter is already a real outdoor adventurer, but I think of Jack as somebody who is adventurous, but very um, responsible and um, really ready to pitch in and, and root for her family and for her mother and grandmother to form a kind of relationship and um, and to form a real relationship and one that is no longer estranged and uh, not necessarily in a saccharine way, but I think that, um, you know, Jack has had this world that is just her and her mother and this beautiful uh, marine preserve where they live, which I guess is kind of, yeah, a crawdad's connection in that way. Um, but um, when Lana comes, I, I think Jack um, is very generous to look at it as um, something that opens up her world as opposed to something that um, takes over her world in a way that um, she is not possibly open to. Well, I think we have to remember that while Beth chose a smaller life away from Jack didn't get to choose that. That's what Jack has grown up in. And so it's almost inevitable that, you know, she's going to want to expand those boundaries, even though it may cause her, you know, to regret some of the things that she could lose or to worry about some things that she could lose. So it's kind of an inverse dynamic, you know, with with Beth. 
Um, That's right. I mean, children don't get to choose the place, you know, that they are living and the people around them. Um, And she's 15 is one of those kind of pivotal ages, you know, it used Mm -hmm. to be, and think, I think in France, it may still be, or maybe just became the age of consent. Mm-hmm. So, you know, mm-hmm. when people lived shorter lives, girls got married at 13. Sure. They were moms by sure. 15. And, you know, here's Jack. Um, well, and- my best friend is a high school um, ninth grade sex ed teacher. And so she actually helped me a lot in thinking about where is Jack at developmentally to think about some of these um, identity challenges she has around, you know, not knowing her father, um, being a biracial girl who, you know, is not connected to one side of her identity um, through family. And um, and then also just, you know, developmentally, how do you deal when these major things come into your life? You know, when you're a teenager, everything is an 11 on the scale of drama. And certainly finding a dead body is um, way off the charts in a lot of that way. So there is a murder, and that does bring in what police, yes. or at least authorities. Maybe it's the sheriff. I'm trying to remember. I think where you are is probably a sheriff. Sheriff, right. that's right. Sheriff right. deputies. Um, yeah. Those of you who are sophisticated in crime fiction know that sheriffs are counties, and police are our towns and cities and villages and so forth. But anyway, authorities, um, and there have to be other suspects, especially if Jack is going to not be, you know. Well, we don't know whether Jack is actually the killer or not. We don't even know if there was a motive. We don't know if there's more than one suspicious death. There are a whole lot of things that have to unfold. So, you know, one of the reasons I like this book better than Crawdads is the plot makes a lot more sense. (laughs) It really does. Um, I, I love the girl and I love the nature in Crawdads. I have to say, I never saw that kind of success coming to a book that I think is beautiful, but still flawed. Um, And so maybe, you know, I kind of of adopted um, Mother Daughter Murder Night as a a different version. Um, I mean, I'll take it. (laughs) And I know I have a lovely photo of Delia sitting in our store, you know, signing copies. And every time I see it, I think... (laughs) Why didn't I order thousands? But the answer is that I really didn't see it coming. And Mm -hmm. I wonder how many people at the very beginning, you know, had any idea. Mm -hmm. And if you do this long enough, in our case, nearly 34 years, what you know is you just can't predict it. There is a trajectory that could take off the Da Vinci Code, you know, Twilight. I mean, Twilight, she lives here. You know, we did an event for her and her publisher said, you really ought to have more books than you've ordered. And I thought, why? (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, you know, we're really good when we're good, but sometimes you just don't see it. It may not be to your own taste or it may be so different. And every time you get a book that's a wild success, you get clones. It kind Mm. of resets things and it starts a trend. And so you get more books where nature is involved. Mm. After Mm -hmm. Crowd Ads, after the Da Vinci Code, there were like three years of Da Vinci clones. We got nothing but religious conspiracy thriller Mm -hmm. because publishers tend to follow, you know, market demand. And, you know, it's you're now far enough away from 2018. (laughs) This is five years on, you know, that I don't think anyone can say, oh, look, you know, it's a Crowd Ads clone or, you know, we're, we're in that trend. I well, think it, and, we and moved on that yeah. beyond the trend. Well, well, first of all, thank if if you're making any predictions that this book could be a tenth of the success of that kind of book, you know, I'll take it. I, but I, um I don't know that any book yeah, can be of like course. It. How do you know? But I, I will say that, you know, when I signed with my agent, one of the I think the nice things about what you're describing is that for authors, or at least for debut authors. I didn't even know there were trends, you know, in terms of I was writing the book that um, I thought would make my mom smile. I was writing the book that I wanted to read. My mom and I have always been fans of traditional mysteries. You know, Faye Kellerman has been a big um, person in our life, my life growing up, you know, which is, of course, a Jewish, an Orthodox Jewish woman and uh, an Irish cop in Los Angeles, which is where I grew up and we're a Jewish family. But um but when my agent, when I signed with my agent, she said, you know, this could be a very hard book to sell because it's kind of 
partly a family drama and partly a mystery. And, you know, she was saying uh, domestic suspense and these thrillers have been very successful. I'm not sure where this is going to sit. And then, of course, we got unbelievably lucky that Thursday Murder Club, Finley Donovan, Vera Wong, you know, that they're started, The Maid, that they're over the last couple of years have been these books that are these traditional mysteries with some humor, with some warm heartedness, and that, um, you know, it became possible for a book like Mother Daughter Murder Night um, to sell very quickly to a publisher, which I'm so grateful for. And, you know, people have sent me pictures of this book next to uh, Benjamin Stevenson's book, Everybody in My Family Has Killed Someone. You know, there are even these titles that are kind of related, this idea around family and around um, coziness and murder. And I actually wonder if in some ways that's a reaction to the pandemic, because, you know, I wrote this book in response and in the context of my mom's illness, but it was also a time when a lot of people were struggling with a lot of different crises around, you know, what was happening in 2020 and 2021. And at least for me, that sent me as a reader back to books that were a comfort for me. And for me, that's traditional crime fiction. Um, you know, it is Sue Grafton, it is Janet Ivanovich, it's Faye Kellerman, um, it's old Don Winslow. And um, I think that uh, this idea of a comfortable, you know, it's so odd in some ways to think murder and comfort might go together. But of course, you know, Louise Penny is the queen of this, right? And so I, I think that at least for me, this was a time when um, I was seeking something that was lighter, that was warm hearted at its core, even if um, there was going to be murder and crime happening. And um, I think that you know, there is a mini trend around that, that I'm so grateful that Mother Daughter Murder Night um, can, uh, you know, to some extent contribute to or be part of. If we have a trend at the moment, it actually is towards sort of cross genre books. Mm. You know, it's always the unexpected that that takes mm. off, you know, mm. I, I'll tell you a story about the Da Vinci Code when you're here, I'm not going to say it right here. Um, and it's the same thing with credits. You know, mm. again, um, it's the unpredictable book that resets everything. Mm. We're just like another book, you know, mm. um, it doesn't have any. And, and it's fascinating to, you know, I, I have to read or at least go through a couple of hundred books a month. There are 288 mm. hardcover adult fiction novels published every week at this wow. point. I've been wow. getting statistics that I do my best to cover maybe 200 a month. There are many that, you know, I'm not interested in. Um, I try not to follow trends. I mean, mm. anybody can go to Barnes and Noble, you know, and pick up a trend or something. So we try very hard. Patrick uh, reads, we all read, we try to figure it out. Um, and it's, you know, it's the unexpected that that grabs you, but at the same time, you really can't tell it's going to grab anybody else. What I've learned in 34 years is to trust me, you know, if I like it. Because the first time I wrote a newsletter, I remember saying to my husband, why will anyone care? I really did. You know, it was like, why will anyone care what I think about this book? Mm -hmm. And I had no, I mean, and gradually it's turned out that people do care because people, it's such an overwhelming universe of books. Yeah, people yeah. are interested in guidance, whether it's a book club, whether it's, sure. you know, fellow readers, whether it's, you know, the staff, whatever it is. But it's always, it's, it's almost impossible to navigate the mm. large field of books anymore. Mm. Mm. So, you know, we are influencers. We're not on TikTok. Well, I'm never going to be on TikTok. <laughs> never say never, Barbara. <laughs> no, other, others in the staff can do TikTok. Yeah. I mean, but anyway, you know, um, it, it does require a level of confidence in yourself in, mm. you know, in going forth and saying to people, this is a book I loved and mm. here's why I think you will love it too. And, you know, that's well, I'm just honored. I'm honored you felt that way. Well, and, and to be honest, 
I always thought I was a great reader until when I started writing, I realized, gosh, I am only reading books that show up on certain lists or get reviewed in certain um, newspapers. And as I started reading more widely in crime fiction, I started seeking out, you know, people like you, entities like Poisoned Pen, um, some of the blogs that are out there, because I realized I am only scratching the surface of the amazing diversity of stories that are out there. You know, I, I've gotten very into reading mysteries that um, really involve a deep family story as well. And I just read this book, Saint X, that came out a couple of years ago. And there was a great book called Whatever Happened to Ruthie Ramirez by Claire Jimenez that I loved. And these are books I would not, I did not discover on my own. It's only because of people like you out there who are calling attention to these books. Um, And so I'm so grateful as a reader, as well as as a writer, um, that you're doing this work and, um, and, and consuming this over, you write it is an overwhelming number of books out there, but, but think about, thank goodness. Cause think about, I would never want the, the opposite, right? You'd never want to feel like, gosh, you know, I guess I read all the books in the library. I'm done. I guess I uh, can't go to the bookstore. You know, my, constant, my constant worry up until I started the bookstore was I didn't have enough to read, you know, where will I put <laughs> this book? And now, yeah. now I'm drowning in them, but that's okay. You know, yeah. one yeah. of the other things that we really work very hard on here is to look for independent press books, you know, to look mm-hmm. at, to look for books that are not getting mm-hmm. a lot of hype, a lot of support. The New York Times is not reviewing them, whatever. Sure. Because, you know, sometimes it's not the first book for an mm-hmm. author. In fact, most of the time, it's not the author's first book. It's a later book that really takes off. Sometimes I think there's kind of a wisdom now that's like the seventh book in a series is reading mm-hmm. um, a oh, kind of enough readers stick you know to kind of make it work on the other hand sometimes authors run out of gas at book five in a series because they said all they have to say so you know a question that you will have to answer is whether you are going to continue with these characters or if this is a standalone you don't have to answer it I'm not asking or whether you know whether you're going to write something completely different because I think some stories let's take Gone with the Wind for example I never wanted to know what (laughs) happened when she went back to Tara or sure. America, when the house burned down, that's it, you know? Um, yeah. And I, I think it's important for the author to recognize uh, and not necessarily succumb to commercial pressure. So oh, that did so well, you know, you should write mm. these characters again. Mm. Only, only if you really are convinced there's a great story for these characters to continue, should mm-hmm. you do that. Otherwise, you know, and there is a trend in domestic suspense to write standalones. Because mm-hmm. you tortured mm-hmm. your character. I'm not saying you did, but you know, generally putting people through that kind of pressure and with all the twists and so forth, that's it. Yeah. You, know, you don't want to do that to them again. Well, I, I really appreciate all the backstory. Patrick, come and come and pop in and see if we've elicited any questions or if you have any questions before we sign off. Let's see here. Um, yeah, there. There are a few questions here. However, I think you may have covered these. Um, Robin would like to know, how long have you lived in the Santa Cruz area? Yeah, I've lived uh, in Santa Cruz Mountains for 16 16 years. That's right. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles, and then I went to uh, college um, on the East Coast. I met my husband in Washington, D.C., and we were living in downtown D.C., but we really wanted to get to the West Coast. He grew up very rural in Washington State. I grew up in Los Angeles, and we found this ex-commune in the Santa Cruz Mountains. It's actually quite close to the mystery spot, which is one of those... um, like optical illusion kind of tourist traps. But it's very funny because, you know, we've now lived by the mystery spot for 16 years. And it wasn't until I started writing mystery novels that people started being delighted by this, uh, you know, this uh, address that I, this quirk of my address um, that, you know, to be a mystery writer and, and living um, near the mystery spot. So um, we live up in the mountains and we live off the grid actually in a small community. And um, Barbara, to what you were saying, you know, I have no idea if I'm going to write more with these characters or not, but I do know that um, there are a lot of quirks of the Monterey Bay um, that um, I would be, I would love to dive into. And one of them that I feel like I've had a lot of experience with is these weird hippie commune kind of places in the mountains um, as somebody who 
lives around and uh, in something like that um, and has really happily for the last 16 years. Well, here's the thought, you know, you can center a series on a place. You don't have sure. to figure it on the characters. I mean, that's interesting. Other people living there. So sure. you, know, yeah. you, can, you can leave them aside and you can bring in a new yeah. case, but continue to explore it. I'm going to introduce you about your con to my friend, Lori R. King, fellow mystery oh, writer. For Lucy. I know her. Oh, good. All right. And did yes. you read Back to the Garden? Yes, it was incredible. And it really made me think about, yeah, I used to run the Museum of Art and History in Santa Cruz. And ah. so I had a lot of connection with Filoli and um, some of the kinds of places like the site of that. And Lori was so generous to me when I first started writing mysteries. I called the owner of our local indie um, bookshop, Santa Cruz, and said, you know, I, I want to meet this person, Lori King, you know, she's such a superstar. Is there any way you could connect us? And Lori was so generous and sort of laying out for me, these are the conferences, these are the, the you know, and she really taught me a lot about this uh, industry, which was, I'm so grateful for. Oh, yeah, she's a super mentor, one of my very dearest friends. So I'm really oh, wonderful. To know her. Great. Carry on, Patrick. That's really about it for specific questions. Um, yeah, uh, there's a comment. Every time you drive by Elkhorn Slough, you'll see different birds, uh, different dolphin sculptures on the hill, too. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Oh. And I'll just say I, I had a lot of fun working with not just I, I have a friend who's a wildlife ecologist who helped me um, with some of the research, but um, also my mom and I, you know, we, Barbara, you mentioned earlier the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They put out a beautiful book in, I think, the 90s of the flora and fauna of Elkhorn Slough. And it's one of these, you know, nature illustration books where everything's beautifully hand drawn and watercolored. And it just sort of became our, our research Bible, this book. And um, I'd go out paddle boarding and looking for these different animals and these different plants and trying to figure it all out. You know, I used to, Mar Marsha Muller, another California mystery writer you may have run into used to write some books um, north of San Francisco and Mendocino or whatever mm. it is. And I've always mm. regretted that even though I did my undergraduate career in the San Francisco Bay Area, it was a lot harder to go there in 1958 than it is now. So um, we used to go up to Napa and whatever. We used to go grape stomping and stuff. Mm. In the but I've never been to Mendocino. And other than coming down all the way from... Portland Oregon. to Los Angeles on Highway One one time, mm -hmm. but that you know doesn't do it. But I'm hoping that your book gets people to look at all these coastal communities, or any I hope so. In point of fact, um, Ken Kruger is coming to see us um, mm -hmm. on September 9th. Uh, has written a lot about the uh, Boundary Waters, for yes. example, which yes. is you know an incredible area. Um, Northern yeah, Minnesota absolutely. with Canada and so forth. I, I like to hope that reading a lot of a lot of books like Mother Daughter Murder Night makes people more appreciative and more aware of mm. you know of places whether they live there or visit them and sure. all the things the flora and the fauna whatever that goes with them yeah yeah well and you know as a debut novelist I feel like I wrote this book for such an idiosyncratic reason for my mom and mm. um. I know that now what a gift that this has turned into the next path I'm taking. And um, I don't know what I will be publishing next, but I know that I'm really committed to writing and I feel like I'm just starting, you know, I, I'm proud of this book. I'm excited about this book, but I really feel like I continue to have so much to learn about the craft of writing crime fiction. And I'm just very excited to keep uh, challenging myself and hopefully, you know, delighting readers um, and exploring all kinds of different uh, ways to play in this crime fiction genre. My experience is that the best writers are the people who grow through life going, what if? They go, mm. what if? Mm. when they hear a conversation, they go, what mm -hmm. if? When they see something, whatever. Curiosity is actually the biggest attribute, I think, of successful authors. Um, mm. Most of us sort of take things for granted when we see them, but the great crime writer goes, what a, <laughs> would you agree with that, Patrick? Yeah, definitely. definitely. Yeah, Patrick's a very distinguished editor of crime fiction. He's um, done a lot of great work and he's a critic as well. So anyway, we will look forward to having you at the Poison Pen in person. I will Thank probably you. see you if only at a distance in San Diego. I hope um, so. She mentioned going maybe not on screen to Batrican, and I will remind you all that Batrican is the international 
mystery conference named after Anthony Boucher, who was the New York Times mystery critic for many, many years, because it's a weird name. And if you don't know that, you will wonder why is it called Boucher? Uh, next year, it's going to be in Nashville. It might be a little late to sign up to go to the one in San Diego that starts on Wednesday, but it's not too late to go to Killer Nashville, I think. No. That's a different small conference. Anyway, Boucher Gun in Nashville. And there are small conferences, Left Coast Crime, and um, all over the country. So if you're a reader or a writer, uh, or you're just curious, uh, you can sign up for them. And it's a fellowship thing, but it's also a craft thing. And I encourage you to go. So I, and was, I, I, I have never been to BoucherCon before. This will be my first one, but I've been to Left Coast Crime and I learned so much. And I think that whether you're somebody who loves to read crime fiction or who is writing or aspiring to write, everybody is so friendly and you can really, I went to Left Coast Crime for the first time, um, the, it was two years ago when Mick Heron was the guest of honor and I am obsessed with his books. And my only goal for the conference was to get to talk to him once. And I ended up, he was like the first person I saw. And I went up to him, this extroverted Californian and he, this very nice, um, you know, reserved British guy and his wife um, just sort of accepted my enthusiasm. And I sort of stuck to them for the next four days, whether that was uh, to their chagrin or their joy, but I learned so much and um, it it was just a, a peak life experience. And um, I, I just highly recommend going to one of these if you're a mystery fan, because everybody is so generous and um, so excited to talk to other people who care about this genre. Wow, what a lead in for me to say that Mick Heron, <laughs> we will be talking to him on September 8th, the day after <sighs> We talked to him. Wait, he's not coming in person, is he? No, I was just going to okay. say. But John Sanford, um, one of our one of our dear friends, is such a Mick Aaron fan that he and Patrick and Mick and I are going to do the conversation, uh, which I think will really be fun. But I agree with you, and I have to say, his new book, which is not a slough house book, I right. loved Mick before he ever wrote spy fiction. Mm -hmm. He's great other mm -hmm. kinds of books, but this new one. This new one has maybe one of the best opening chase action scenes anyway that I've read in a long time. But what I really love is the sheer snark. Mm -hmm. I mean, he is so, and you know it's Boris Johnson. You absolutely <laughs> know that the prime minister about whom he is snarking is Boris Johnson. So anyway, it's a great I book. love I, I love his action. I love his humor. But I actually love his diction most. And when I heard that he had originally been a poet, it really made sense to me because I think that nobody hits an image and then gets out of it um, with the kind of precision and restraint that he does. I, I just I think he's extraordinary. Yeah. So, Patrick, you're loving you're loving <laughs> Mick's book. Do you yeah. want to chime in there? No, I mean, I just. I love I love the writing. That's the thing. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. um, you know, and he's such as you say, Barbara. The snark is really great. Uh, but I just love I love his sentences. Yeah. You know, yeah. But he has he has a particularly British sensibility. You know, um, at the way he goes at um, institutions and the rest of it. Um, there's an there's an author I'm currently reading called T. E. Kinsey, who is actually Mick Heron in 1912 with two women. And um, it's one of the it's one of the best now book 10 um, and it's published by Amazon in the UK and over here. And I live for these books because it's in its own way. It's sort of like Mick Heron, completely unexpected. Um, right. The big theft is that of a custom bicycle seat, mm -hmm. uh, which leads in all kinds of ways about what did women actually wear to ride bicycles mm -hmm. and how were the seats constructed so that women were not made miserable by sitting on them for so long, right? Mm -hmm. Who would know? I mean, I love it. Anyway, we've said enough. Thank you very much, Nina. Give your mom our best. Um, and I will look forward to seeing you here. Sounds great. Thank you so much. And I look forward to being there and uh, with your puppy who's been very good through this whole hour too. He's out. Um, I can hear him. <laughs> <laughs> right. Bye. Bye.